Well, hello everyone. We are uh, uh, almost halfway through this incredible day of events going on. And uh, uh, we now are gonna move towards uh, our lunch hour. And our speaker for our lunch hour is our keynote address. Um, and the uh, speaker for our keynote address uh, is uh, Daring Camilleri from uh, the uh, 23rd District of Michigan. But uh, before I, I introduce him, uh, I do want to mention that at 1.15 in this room that we're in, quote unquote room, we're going to be giving away, or giving away, we're going to be uh, having a brief ceremony uh, where we will be uh, awarding the Upper Peninsula Folk Life Awards, which we've been doing every year since 2009, I believe. Um, uh, and uh, so stick around for that after uh, Representative Camilleri's uh, talk and uh, um, uh, just to learn more about that as well. So it'll be right after his talk in this room. Uh, and so with that, I do want to check. We uh, have some chat going on here. It says audio isn't working. Are you picking it up now? Representative Kevin Larry, are you picking up the audio now? Okay, he's gonna leave and hop back in. Um, it looks like I'm live. I, I, uh, if anyone else would wanna... Says I'm good from UAV, so hopefully he can pick us up now. Can you hear me now? Can you hear us? Check, check. I can hear you typing. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can hear you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Am I up? Yeah. I still can't can. hear the audio um, oh, you can't from hear the panels. But... Okay, well, why don't you go? Go ahead. Okay, so I'm on. Well, I want to thank you all so much for having me today. I, I really appreciate um, your time and your uh, willingness to have this tough conversation. You know, I understand that um, these conversations happen every year. And so I'm really glad to be part of it today. Uh, I'm not going to spend the entire time talking about my story, but I, and I want to leave an additional section for questions at the end, um, because I do think that there's more to be learned through dialogue than there is through just me talking. Um, but before I began, I wanted to just talk a little bit more about um, the state of politics before I jumped into my own personal story. So as you know, today we are in the midst of one of the most divisive times in our political history. We have more people who voted than ever before in American history. And we saw a more divided election than we've ever seen before in our history as well. It shows us that there are so many things that we need to learn about each other and more that we need to learn um, from our own communities. People who go to school with, our, with us, people who uh, live right next door to us, live in vastly different worlds than what we do. Even though we're all in the same neighborhood or in the same state, we have very different lived experiences. And that I think has been shown true in this election. Um, you are, we're living in a, an area where folks have completely different facts. They want to believe uh, what they see on their own Facebook feeds and Twitter feeds, and they don't want to look at uh, the truth around them. That to me shows that we've got a tremendous amount of work to do uh, as we continue our, our public work of trying to make this world a better place. My name is Darren Camilleri. I am the state representative for the 23rd district in Downriver Wayne County. Um, this is my going into my third term. I just got reelected for my third term and I'm really excited to continue serving my neighbors. Um, I wanted to talk, start first with a little bit more of my personal story and how I got to this role in leadership, but also from my family's story and what that has done to shape me. And then I wanna talk a little bit more about what it has been like to have, um, to have my story be ripped apart by people in my community um, and to distort my name and distort my record throughout this, this record of service that I've had. 
but at the same time that people in my community who don't come from the same background as me, seeing through it, seeing through it and trusting and believing in me and my leadership um, and disregarding the lies and the racism and the hatred that we do see in our political discourse. Um, so like I said, my name is Darren Kiros Camilleri. I am the son of an immigrant from Malta, which is a small Mediterranean community uh, in the middle of Europe. Uh, we are just south. Uh, Malta is just south of Sicily. It's about 60 miles south of Sicily. It's a tiny island country. Uh, it's where about 450,000 people live. It's one of the smallest countries in the world. Uh, my mom is Mexican American. She was born and raised in Michigan, but her family has roots in Mexico. Uh, my great grandparents came from Mexico uh, and my grandpa came from San Antonio. They worked their way up to Michigan to find uh, opportunity to, in the auto factories, as well as in manufacturing more generally. And they've been able to build their life here in Michigan and here in America. The same goes for my dad and his family. My dad was born in Malta um, and he came with his parents and his siblings when he was six years old. They moved to uh, Detroit with the, uh, the hope of finding access to opportunity in uh, Michigan's factories. My nun knew he, uh, when he brought his whole family here in the 1960s, he ended up finding a job in an air conditioning factory. And he worked there for 30 years, uh, building parts for air conditioners and retired making about 10 bucks an hour. My nunna, my grandma, she, uh, she just raised my dad and his siblings. She would babysit some of the neighbors down the street. Uh, and they lived in a primarily Maltese American community in Southwest Detroit um, for many years and then moved to Dearborn Heights a little bit later. My mom's side of the family, uh, they also found their, their story in America in Southwest Detroit. It's where uh, my grandpa and my grandma met. Uh, they, my mom was born in, in Detroit and then they moved over to Mount Clemens because my grandpa got a job um, in an auto factory out there. They later made their way to Down River, which is where um, my grandpa got moved to a Ford plant uh, and they've lived there for the, the past 30 years. My parents actually met on a factory floor. <laughs> they both met uh, at a factory making plastics parts um, in the late 1980s uh, and that's where they met and their story began from there. They then had me, my younger brother and a, you know, a little bit of a gap, but then my younger sister as well. My dad uh, then eventually got a job at the same auto factory that my mom's dad worked at at Ford uh, and we've been able to get our ticket to the middle class. We, our story is not that atypical from a lot of people who live in Downriver. We are home to the auto industry. We are home to people, to working class people, folks who are used to making things uh, for a living. But our world got rocked when the Great Recession hit in 2008. It was one of the scariest moments that I think uh, so many of our families in this community and across Michigan uh, experienced. My dad was laid off for uh, about two and a half years uh, and my mom was not working at the time. She was, uh, she was a homemaker. And so we only had one income when I was in high school. I had to uh, make up some of that myself by uh, getting a couple jobs when I was in high school. I you know, scooped ice cream, I waited tables, I uh, cut lawns for people. I did whatever I could to scrape by to make it so that my family was able to uh, not worry about me uh, and I could provide a little bit of extra money for, for us while my dad was laid off. Uh, it took uh, that entire two year period, but once we hit through about 2010, uh, 2011, Ford did hire him back and we were in a much better position again. Uh, and he's still employed and still doing really well at Ford. So we're very thankful for that. When I talk about my cultural identity and growing up, um, growing up as somebody who has multiple ethnic backgrounds, it's, uh, it is a struggle to, um, to always explain. I'm in a position where I'm always explaining what my cultural background is. Uh, when I talk about being from Malta, we always gotta talk about where Malta is because of how few Maltese Americans there are in the country. However, we are the largest uh, group of Maltese Americans in the US in Metro Detroit. And so there is a community of Maltese American folks here in this area. And then when I talk about being Latino, um, you're not going to automatically know I'm Latino until I tell you. My, my parents 
um, you know, they chose to to give me more of an American name, uh, Darren, uh, versus giving me one that is rooted in my in my ancestors. But I always make sure to make to be talking about um, my cultural identity because I think that it is so important to who I am and to the way that I was raised. And I wanted to talk about a couple of moments where um, I have been seen as being an insider versus being an outsider and the other way around. Um, growing up, you know, around here in Metro Detroit, um, I went to a primarily white school, a primarily white Catholic school, and I was the one of the few students who had um, a diverse cultural background like the one that I have. And so uh, any time that I was explaining my cultural identity, I was doing so um, to a group of, of mostly white friends. Uh, for me growing up, I never really felt like there were uh, these, these moments where I was ostracized so clearly until I got to high school. And that was when things became very clear to me that my story was not the same as everybody else's. I, I will never forget, um, you know, in some times, uh, in some days going to school, uh, bringing in some Mexican food or bringing in some Maltese food for lunch um, and having friends make fun of me for that. Um, the way that it smelled or the way that it looked or uh, just treating me differently based on the lunch that I brought. Those types of moments uh, reminded me that maybe I am a little bit different than everybody else. And then there was one moment in particular um, that I will, that I think had really shaped my racial identity um, because it was so striking to me. I was, uh, it was my senior year of high school. We're in, in the midst of applying to colleges. You know, I was going to be the first in my family to go to college. So I was incredibly excited about all the different opportunities that I was going to have before me. I got into Kalamazoo College, which is a small liberal arts school over in Southwest Michigan, one of the best liberal arts schools in the Midwest. I was ex incredibly excited about it. Um, I'd never heard about Kalamazoo until I started researching colleges. But once I looked into it more, I was really excited about the possibility of going there. And uh, during the application process, they give you uh, a couple of different buckets for different scholarships that you can apply for. And one of them was for high achieving uh, Latino or Hispanic students. So fitting that category, I of course applied for that scholarship. And when I got into Kalamazoo, I did receive the scholarship and I was very excited because the price tag at Kalamazoo College is really high and the scholarship was about $5,000 a month. And that was, uh, you know, that was a huge relief if, for my possibility of going to the school. When I went to go tell my friends um, at school one day at lunch, hey, I just got in, I just got this scholarship, I'm so excited about it. One of my friends uh, got outraged. He was incensed at the idea that I got a scholarship uh, that was specifically for Hispanic or Latino students. Literally, the quote he said was, I will never forget this, where's my white man scholarship? Where's my white man scholarship? We almost got into a fight that day at lunch. Um, he literally jumped out of the out of the, the, his seat, was saying how it's so unfair that I was given this advantage that he did not have access to. Never mind the fact that there was this was specifically for students who had over a 28 on their ACT and over a 3.8 uh, GPA. Uh, but that was a moment that stood out so clearly to me in my racial identity that I was not the same as everybody else and that people were going to hold grudges against me for being different. And that was uh, certainly something that I learned. Uh, and it showed me that when I am standing true to who I am and who, who my family is, that there are gonna be people who are upset about that. And that's just not how things should be. A little bit later on, uh, it was, I want to say it was like the same year, um, we were with my grandpa uh, out driving from, I think it was a restaurant to his house. Uh, my grandpa decided to take me and my cousins um, in, in their car. And it was on our way home when 
one, there was another driver next to us had a little bit of road rage and he uh, took a, a thing of pennies in his hand. And what he supposedly perceived as my grandpa cutting him off, he took this, this bag of pennies and threw it at my grandpa's car. Uh, my grandpa is, is a pretty, you know, pretty brown Latino man. And uh, in that moment, this man started yelling, calling him the N-word, screaming at us, making it so visibly different, making us seem so visibly different through, his, through that man's racism and his hatred towards people of color. We then went to the police and the police really didn't say that they could do anything about it. Uh, we just had to get my grandpa's car fixed. But that was another moment in my life where I realized that I was different than everybody else, that my family was different than everybody else. Another moment happened in college. Uh, my cousins and I took a trip to DC to go see the sites and the monuments. And uh, on our way home, uh, we were stopping in the gift shop on the way out. We're wearing hoodies and, and backwards hats, just like college kids normally would. Uh, and a, a woman in the gift shop was following us around very clearly, thinking that we were going to steal something. Again, finding a moment to make us feel different. On the way home, while we were driving, we stopped in the middle of Pennsylvania uh, at a subway shop uh, in somewhere in rural Pennsylvania that uh, didn't seem to have a lot of Latino people who had ever been around. And we were just being uh, completely ostracized by the looks in people's faces. Uh, you could tell that we were not welcome uh, as we were getting our sandwiches and just trying to have some lunch. I, I tell you these stories because it's important for us to remember that the racism and the exclusion and the outsider feeling that so many Americans have today is real. It's real and it has not gone away. The, and the election, I think, actually has shown that people hold this racial animus so closely to their hearts. And that is not something that uh, gives me comfort. It makes people like me and families like mine afraid, afraid to live in our culture and to be as, um, as and to be as clearly uh, proud of our ancestors as anybody else. And those were the moments for me that really were wake up calls um, for what it meant to be someone who is Latino, someone who is an, a son of an immigrant from Malta, to always have to explain my cultural identity. And those are just personal experiences. I really got the wake up call uh, when I started to run for politics, to run for office. That's when things started looking uh, even more clear for how much hatred and division there is out there, but also the power of people using racism to, uh, to advance an agenda. So I wanna talk a little bit more about my personal story uh, in terms of how I got to where we are with politics. So this, this personal narrative of, of who I am and how it shaped my identity, it really drove me to wanna be someone who serves, someone who gives back to a, com a community, someone who uh, participates in civic life, someone who is part of our community to try to make things better. Because seeing those moments and experiencing those, those things uh, drove me to want to do more. And when I was uh, going through my, my college experience, I realized that I wanted to do more and to teach and to be part of educating folks about how to live and create a better world. And so I became a teacher. I joined the Teach for America program and I got placed in Southwest Detroit in the very same neighborhood that both sides of my family had built their American story. It was a full circle moment for me that I was gonna teach in that same neighborhood that my family was, that, that my family found uh, opportunity here in Michigan. It was really exciting. On my first day of work, um, I got appointed department chair, which I thought was kind of crazy. I had no textbooks, no curriculum, and, but I was given this charge to make it so that my kids were successful, that they not only beat the odds, but exceeded expectations. And so just like any good son of an immigrant would do, I rolled up my sleeves, I made do with what we had, 
and we did find success for my kids. I created a Detroit history class for my high school seniors so that we could connect Detroit's past to our present and think about our roles in the world. I taught AP Human Geography and connected uh, the various diasporas from all over the world into how we were talking about the changing demographics of, of Michigan and of Metro Detroit. And we did make sure that my students found success. Every single one of my kids got into at least a community college and some of them went on to places like Michigan State. Uh, or Grand Valley or the University of Michigan. Even a couple went to Kalamazoo College, which was a really proud moment for me. But through all of that, I also recognized that it wasn't going to be enough for me to just help out my students in that classroom, that I needed to do more to create change at a systemic level, to make it so that more students had opportunities to live out their full expectations and their full potential. So I decided maybe we should run for office. Maybe we should look at creating change from within the system and do so through, uh, through electoral politics, through the state legislature. There was a seat open in my hometown uh, in Downriver Wayne County uh, that was open for the state legislature in 2016. And so we decided after consulting with some of my friends and mentors and family that we should give it a go. That we should try to represent this district because it is my hometown and create change for all of us. Along the way, uh, some people didn't like the idea of a young, not very experienced brown guy running for state rep, uh, especially in an area that had never seen someone like me represent uh, them in the state house. We ran up against a longtime city council person in one of my communities. Um, she was actually the clerk, eventually became the clerk. Um, and she was serving as clerk longer than I'd been alive. And this is in the primary. We also ran against a younger guy who was city council person uh, and just recently got elected a city council person who's around my age actually. Uh, and folks either gave, in the political circles, gave one of those two the best chances at winning to not only win the primary, but to flip the state legislature seat um, for Democrats for the first time in six years. But we blocked out all the noise and said, we're gonna go take our case to the people. We are going to raise money from every person that we've ever met. We're going to knock on more doors than anybody else. And we're going to have conversations about the future of our community, no matter where you come from, who you are, and what your background is. We're going to tell your story in Lansing. And so that's exactly what we did. We built a grassroots campaign based on young people and people in our community. And we went to work. We knocked on 24,000 doors in the primary alone. We uh, raised about $60,000 to tell our story from, from people, from, we raised it from individuals. And we uh, took our stories to the streets. And that's the way that we were able to find success. But I will say that even, uh, even in democratic politics, folks will throw race and racism into the equation to try to get ahead. So when we were uh, winning, on the ground and, and with money and people saw that we were taking the lead in the primary, one of my Democratic opponents uh, in the last week of the election started to attack me, not only on perceived uh, versions of what my record was, but she literally used a dark money group to uh, claim that I wanted to keep our communities less safe. There were two flyers uh, that basically said that I wanted to uh, only stand with Black Lives Matter protesters and I wanted to keep our community less safe. It's the same narrative that you heard now in 2020 about this idea of, of basically defunding police and, and things like that, but we heard it in 2016 first. Not only did they darken my image on the flyer, they put bloody handcuffs over my face. And they said that Darren Camilleri's dangerous friends want to uh, keep our communities less safe. I was stunned, quite frankly, that this was the attack that they were going to use. And this is coming from another Democrat. But I will say that folks in the Democratic primary, voters themselves, saw through it. You know, we had had so many personal conversations with people that 
uh, people did not like the negative attacks, especially the, the racism, the very clear racism of those attacks. They put my personal phone number on this flyer, by the way, and we got 50, 100 phone calls from people telling me that they knew who did this, they knew where, where it came from, and that they were going to support me because of it. So thankfully, um, it didn't work. But that was only the first step. <laughs> the second step, again, this is all in 2016, um, was getting through the general election. Again, this was the most top targeted seat in um, the state legislature that year. Uh, and so the Republicans were going to try to use the same types of attacks that we saw in the primary to try to win. They called me a, a radical. They called me, uh, they used the same attacks that my primary opponent did. They darkened my image in TV commercials. They spent over $700,000 attacking me in my name. But because we built out a grassroots organization, we met people person to person. I told my story about Downriver and what we were going to do for our schools, for our infrastructure, for our environment. I personally knocked on 17,000 doors that election cycle. And I met these folks. And we were able to convince enough of them that the racism and the hatred that we were seeing on the attack ads uh, was just too much and it wasn't real and that you shouldn't believe it. And that my story, that our conversations were what we're going to bring our community together and drive our community forward. We ended up winning that election in 2016 by 323 votes out of 47,000 that were cast. It was the closest election uh, for the state house that year. I was the only Democrat to flip a seat that year as well. And I say all that to say that my district also voted for President Trump at the same time. President Trump got 12% more than Hillary Clinton did in my community, and we won by half a point. So there were folks who voted for Trump and voted for me because we told my story about perseverance and getting things done for our community. Now, uh, the Republicans never let me forget that. Um, my first day of work uh, as an incoming legislator, the Speaker of the House told me on day one that he was going to make it his mission to defeat me. They were so upset that I was able to win over a community that, quite frankly, I, I probably shouldn't have won based on the numbers, um, that they were going to make it their number one goal to defeat me. Uh, but we worked hard. We continued to build coalitions in my community. We showed up and we listened. I had you know hundreds of coffee hour events and, and in-person gatherings. Uh, we visited every single school multiple times. I uh, created a teacher of the month program. We did things to lift up my community and to tell our story, but we also focused on getting things done specifically for my community. Um, and that's how I think that we were able to create the opportunity for me to be successful in a highly polarized, highly racialized electorate. Um, folks saw me as someone who was from Downriver, young Downriver kid, who was dreaming big and trying to get things done for us. Very specifically, we've got a couple infrastructure problems that I was able to help solve. And that's why I think a lot of folks have been able to trust me to be their voice in Lansing. Um, I think we're, we're getting close to about time for when um, we want to be able to start taking some questions, but I wanted to leave with this last, literally just this last election cycle. So we were doing incredibly well. We won in 2016. We then expanded our margin in 2018, ended up winning by about um, 13 points. Uh, my Republican opponent in 2018 didn't get a lot of party support. Um, and I think one of the reasons why is that he um, really had some strange writings on the internet. He had some weird pictures of him with um, some very racist imagery as well. Uh, and so the Republicans did not support him openly and we were able to win by a good margin. It was also blue wave year, but come 2020, <laughs> things looked a little bit different. Uh, you know, we know that the presidential election has been so polarizing. And so we were anticipating um, a lot of folks still turning out for the president. And so we knew we had to still have a, an incredible ground game, even during a pandemic. Um, and we started knocking on doors this summer, even during a pandemic, very safely, very carefully. Uh, but then these last two weeks of this election, the Republicans decided to uh, spend half a million dollars attacking me and my record, claiming that I wanted to defund the police. I don't. Uh, claiming that uh, I was a radical, that I was a socialist, all these things. I'm not. And they used, again, 
their only playbook is using racism and, and racial imagery to drive fear into the hearts of voters. Um, I'm happy to say that it did not work and that we won re-election uh, this last, just this week by about five points. However, the president did win my district again. He won it by eight points. So we saw the same thing happening where folks voted for the president and voted for me, even amidst the intense uh, amount of racism that was thrown our way, doing the exact same thing. I mean, they even put a flyer out there saying that I wanted to defund the police. Uh, and yeah, I'm a young guy, I wear backwards hats. I had a picture of, a, of me with a backwards hat on the internet somewhere. And uh, they did that, they made me look extra brown and they tried to make me look like a thug. I mean, this is what they do to try to make us seem like outsiders. Um, we have, however, overcome it, not only through the electoral system, but through story after story of people in my community saying things like, you're the best state representative that we've ever had. Thank you for fighting for my unemployment benefits. You know, that is the reason why I'm supporting you. You are the only Democrat I'm voting for because you get things done for us. I mean, we hear it time and again. So even though things may seem divided and horrible and really, really tough, we have found moments of hope. Hope where we never thought that it would exist. Folks who fly Trump flags but are voting for me because they saw my inherent humanity, that they saw that my work ethic of getting things done to try to help them worked. It is not a cure-all. I mean, we've got other systemic problems here that we need to address. We've got to figure out how to talk about politics without using race as the only motivating factor. Um, you know, Democrats don't, don't dealing that type of fear in people. It is Republicans who are doing that. And that is what I think we need to have a national conversation about is figuring out how we have a politics that is based on policy, not fear. And that can be about hope and not the past. So uh, it has been a wild ride in electoral politics and in my role in, serve, in serving my community. Um, but I, I, I still am hopeful that there is a pathway when you create relationships with people on an individual basis that you can get past all of the, the ways that people make you feel different and create those opportunities for change. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Can you hear me now? Darren, can you hear me? Okay, apparently not. I, mean, so I still can't hear um, Dan's audio, but if there's any other way that we can take the questions, I'd be uh, happy to I'm gonna, uh, Dan, do you want me to read the questions if I can be heard? I don't know if he, anyone can, if he can hear anyone. Darren, can you hear me? All right, so the question here uh, in the Q&A we've got is, um, thank you for your time and your story. As a community member in Metro Detroit, do you see the insider-outsider lines becoming more rigid at times um, of state or national crises? And I wonder how catastrophes such as 9-11 alter those who get access to resources or daily needs and how those individuals or groups gain that access. If the lines do get more rigid in times of crises, do you see a washing away of those lines during better times? It's a fascinating question. I think that, yes, I mean, in moments of national crises, whether it's something like a 9-11 or something like a pandemic, you are seeing um, people revert to their old, um, their old corners of, of racial animus, right? That, that you're gonna go into this group ideology and folks will, um, will go back to who they know best. And you see that in the way that we allocate resources always, right? I mean, during this pandemic, you know that the communities that were hardest to hit were communities of color. But in Michigan, the state legislature is run by mostly white people. We have a, a white majority in the uh, Republican caucus in the state legislature. They're the ones who run the show and they don't feel the effects in the same way that communities of color do. Right, they come from majority white communities. And so when there are moments of crises, folks are trying to, uh, to protect their own. You see it constantly. So even when we lost a colleague of mine in the state legislature, there still was not enough direct action to tackle the crises. 
And it's sad to me that because it was, it feels like because it was a democratic member that lost their life from Detroit, that we didn't get the same type of response as if it were somebody, if it had happened to somebody else. And that's what scares me is that we don't see empathy in each other, even in moments of crises, that we choose to continue those divisions as a society, even in those moments. And that really, really frightens me. All right, we've got another question here. Uh, based on your experiences in the Michigan legislature, if you were to go back to teaching, is there a civic process issue or a topic that you would think would work well to guide middle or high school uh, in a way that allows them to acknowledge their biases and strengths while working towards an outcome on a common problem or an opportunity? One of the things that I would love to see us really think about across schools, across the state and country is looking at um, social justice uh, coursework, cultural, culturally competent, curriculum and teaching about race and racism very clearly in our curriculum for our students. Students just don't, we, you cannot get the full picture of what race and racism is just through history textbooks alone. Certainly there are opportunities to have those conversations. We can learn about the struggles and we can learn about um, the very clear laws that were passed to enact and, and further racism. But until you have a conversation that un, undoes, undoes all the, the, um, the history that we've learned and the ways that we've learned through our society to uphold white supremacy, uh, you're not gonna have the type of society that you wanna see out of our young people. We're talking about being anti-racist. You have to learn anti-racism. I mean, you have to learn diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those programs should be incorporated into some of our social studies classrooms. I really, I really believe that. Um, in terms of a, specifically a legislature driven process, one of the things that I did uh, as a teacher, and I know a lot of schools have this program, it's called the Michigan Youth and Government Program. I was the advisor for that at the school that I taught at. And um, I think more students should be participating in programs like that because they actually emulate the governmental process and they learn how to negotiate and they learn what it takes to get things done. Um, even though it is a mock government system, I do think that there are, pro are, are ways there for kids to learn about how to get things done and make things a little bit better. Yeah, any of those types of programs that you see, We the People, Soapbox, Michigan Youth and Government, I mean, those are types of programs that we wanna see more young people participate in um, because you're gonna experience people, young kids are gonna experience other young kids from other walks of life at the same time, right? That's the other thing that I think we're going to see um, that you need to see is that you need to see other people's lived experiences out loud. If you are isolated in a community that is that everybody is just like you, you're never going to fully understand the experiences of others. And I think that a lot of our young people are very isolated, whether it's through social media or even in their own schools where they don't experience other, um, other folks walks of life. And that's one of the ways that I think that you can create those different learning opportunities. So someone wants to, uh, you want to learn a little bit more about the Maltese community in Detroit. So the Maltese community, um, is about 40,000 strong in Metro Detroit. There are a couple of um, Maltese American clubs uh, in Metro Detroit. So Malta is, again, this place in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. The interesting thing about Malta that is not so clearly um, defined is our culture. So Malta is in Europe, but it draws from multiple cultures in the region. So the language actually is a combination of Arabic and Italian. With a little bit of English mixed in as well. A lot of our food in our culture is very similar, similarly mashing those cultures as well. It's a lot of Middle Eastern influence as well as Italian influence uh, as well. Um, so Malta itself is a unique country with a unique culture. It's a, it's a mix match of all these different things because of all the different cultures that have conquered the island over the years. Um, in Metro Detroit, the community is, is pretty strong. I mean, we mostly meet at these different clubs that we have. There's one in Detroit, one in Dearborn. I, uh, my family goes to the one in Dearborn. It's the one that I, I grew up in. Um, and the, the interesting thing though about the Maltese community in Metro Detroit is that we're not, not all located in one place. In Detroit is where the Maltese community started. But like many communities in Detroit during the rise of freeways and the policies that 
broke apart communities, uh, immigrant communities and communities of color. Um, we actually had a freeway drive through uh, and was basically busted up the entire Maltese American community in Metro Detroit. We had a Maltese American church before my dad even got here that was torn down for the building of freeway, a freeway there. We lost Maltese American businesses. And so a lot of our Maltese American cultural identity just got dispersed from there. Um, folks still live in Detroit, but they're also in Dearborn and Livonia and downriver and all over the metro region. So the cultural identity uh, all, basically all comes together through these different um, clubs that we have. Folks go to mass once a week. We have Maltese food together. We celebrate festas and different holidays together. And that's the way that we still are able to um, continue our our Maltese American cultural identity. I will say though, the Maltese language is, is primarily lost uh, outside of those who were immigrants themselves. A lot of uh, the immigrant immigrants who came here chose to just primarily speak English to their kids. So I don't speak Maltese um, pretty much at all. I, I know some phrases here and there, but, uh, and I've tried to learn, but my dad never taught me, you know, Maltese, uh, Maltese folks who live in the U.S. as well as Maltese people who live in Malta also speak English as an official language because Malta was colonized by Great Britain. Uh, and so we have a, a strong culture, a strong community, but we're not as uh, unified as one might think. And yes, buy Maltese in Michigan from the local bookstore. There's a lot to learn. Um, there's a lot to learn from. There's a couple different books about the Maltese community that you can learn a little bit more about as well. All right, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks again to uh, Representative Camilleri. That was a fantastic talk. And uh, I think very relevant, uh, not only today, but as we so much in, uh, in the Upper Peninsula and here at the Bomir UP Heritage Center, so much of what we uh, talk about is, um, is ethnicity and identity um, and the story of people coming from far away uh, to uh, create a new life and the experiences that they have. And it's always, remember, always important to remember that uh, all of us, uh, with the exception of those of us who are uh, Native American or purely Native American, all of us came from someplace else, our families from far away, uh, and we're outsiders. And uh, now we are insiders in a way. Uh, and it takes a long time for us to become insiders. Just like I talked earlier about uh, moving from the Lower Peninsula to the UP. Uh, I was definitely an outsider as a kid. And uh, sometimes I still feel that way though. Now I feel pretty much an insider. Um, but this is an experience that goes far beyond just our regional approach. It's, it's also nationally. And, um, and so I think, uh, Representative Carol Larry for really a, a powerful story about his experience and, and how we still have a long way to go uh, in bridging that gap uh, in America. Um, but uh, it was a really wonderful talk and thanks for the great questions. I know Joe, you, you presented some of those questions. Um, uh, grazie. I, the question I wanna